Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here uh, for this session that's called Women in STEM. My name is Kendra Gaither. I serve as president of the US Africa Business Center here at the Chamber. And for me, this conversation is a personal one. I hail from Hampton, Virginia, uh, which is the home of the hidden figures. And I studied at North Carolina A&T and worked at Carnegie Mellon University. So a conversation where we get to hear from formidable women in the STEM field, which is uh, women who chose careers in science, technology, engineering, or math is one that's both personal, but one that's really vital and integral uh, for our nation. So I'm honored to be able to uh, share a conversation with these formidable leaders. You'll be able to see their bios on the QR codes that are um, about the room, um, but I really wanna make sure that we have a chance to hear from these leaders in their own words uh, about their career paths and about their work in STEM. Um, so I'm going to start for this from me um, with Michelle, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just give a short introduction of themselves, their roles, and particularly as it relates to the session topic, women in STEM. Okay. Michelle. Thank you, Kendra. Um, I'm Michelle Faison Oldham. I'm the national director for the federal civilian sales team at T-Mobile. Um, I've been with T-Mobile about three years. Um, my uh, T-Mobile colleagues are sitting here in the front, uh, so excited to be here today, so thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy Knoyer, and I'm from the Travelers Insurance Companies, hailing from Hartford, Connecticut, and once again, we have the Travelers table here as well. I'm the Chief Information Officer, as well as the Chief Operations Officer of the Bond and Specialty Segment uh, here at the Travelers. I've been there for a little more than 20 years, and uh, living my best life being a woman in STEM. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. <laughs> That's a yeah. hard one to follow. All of you are <laughs> doing that for sure. Bronwyn. Hi, I'm Bronwyn Morgan, and I am the CEO and founder of Zio Air. Zio is a drone manufacturer, smart drones. We're brand new, and also I have another company called Airversity, which is focused on drone services, data analytics, as well as professional drone tra training. I am an FAA certified drone pilot and a drone pro and an FAA safety team rep. Thank you. Susan. Hello, I'm Susan Warner. I uh, work at MasterCard for 13 years. I head up global community engagement for the company and founded a program called Girls for Tech. Thank you, and thank you for the, sharing with us your diverse experience and how you come together to this topic. Um, I'd really like to give a shout out at this time to T-Mobile and Travelers, uh, the teams that are here, but those that are in the room, um, as they are, uh, yes. They are two of our, our table sponsors along with Kimberly Clark, so thank you all and, and thank you uh, for your partnership. So let's maybe start by painting a picture of what it's like today to be a woman, uh, a woman working in STEM. And Bronwyn, I'm gonna start with you because you just talked about being a two-time founder and an entrepreneur um, uh, leading companies. Um, can you tell us, has this always been your path? And maybe um, was it business ownership or, or tech uh, companies that you really expected to be, you know, sort of how you left your mark over time? Yeah, no, I uh, started in business. I really wanted to be a fighter pilot when I graduated from high school. Women could not fly fighters at that time, so I'm dating myself. And so I thought, well, I'll just go work at JPL and I will apply to NASA and become an astronaut. I did not do that. <laughs> um, I wound up going into business, working for big companies like Pro the Procter & Gamble Company and Coca-Cola, um, and spent a lot of my years in innovation and doing some work in R&D in addition to you know, management from a sales marketing and um, general strategy perspective. So I had this bug that always kind of pulled me back to uh, you know, something related to science, technology, start working in and out of Silicon Valley in different capacities over about 20 years. Um, and when drones came up as a civilian commercial opportunity, I was like, this is it, it's happening. And so I got my FA uh, certification as a drone pilot and used my business experience and innovation experience to create one of the companies and then the, the other one came right behind. So I'm super excited about that. Well, thank you for sharing that example. That's really a powerful story. And like you, I thought I was to be an astronaut and look how you use your powers exactly. for good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
question. I want to bring Tracy and Michelle into the conversation um, because both have perspectives leading technology teams, um, and both of you are representing your company's tech capabilities both internally and externally. Um, is it fair to say that um, men still outnumber women um, in these realms? And if so, how do you think it's uniquely beneficial to have a woman at the helm of these positions? Michelle, I'll let you go first. Thank you. Um, so to answer your first question, Kendra, yes. Uh, I definitely work in a male-dominated field. Telecom just historically has, has always been male-dominated, not necessarily a bad thing. but. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is when I first started at T-Mobile, um, my team was about 95% men. And today, I'm happy to um, report that we're at about 50%. So there's parity. Um, and that is something that I'm, I'm very focused on, making sure that um, we continue to move that forward throughout the business, not just on my team. So to bring in diverse perspectives, all of those things. I know we heard a lot of uh, great statistics or sad statistics earlier today, so it is true that there are still very few women in STEM. And it doesn't just end with the C-suite, it actually starts right at the beginning. So if you think about today, how many women are actually graduating with degrees in STEM? How many women are in high school thinking about that or yeah. junior high? So what is that pipeline? So really one of the things that I'm always focused on is not just what's happening at work and bringing some of the great women I have here today with me along for the ride, but how do I influence the next generation of women um, in the Hartford, Connecticut area to see what an amazing uh, career in STEM can be. That's right. So a lot of work left to do. Um, and it's Absolutely. clear that you all have operated with intention because mm -hmm. the numbers that you have and the impact that you have doesn't happen by accident. So Correct. thank you for sharing that story. And I think it's a perfect segue into Susan's work uh, because, Susan, you're leading the work of developing uh, a program and programs that really help cultivate today's young girls um, and cultivate their interest in a STEM future, which is, it sounds like is going to be really key for the pipelines that, that your peers are building here on stage. Um, you're nearing the 10th anniversary of a program yes. called Girls for that you referenced in your intro. First, congratulations. Thank That's a, a monumental achievement. Um, but could you share with us a little bit about how Girls for Tech uh, came to be at, at MasterCard, and why is it important for you both personally and professionally? Sure. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I came from a, a, grew up in a very small town, not a lot of STEM role models running around, a lot of farmers, a lot of fishermen, uh, but, but very <laughs> few STEM role models except my mom. Um, she raised five kids on her own. She taught herself to be a bookkeeper. So she's definitely the M in STEM for me. Um, she kept saying to me, math is going to be your friend. And I was like, you're crazy, crazy mom. <laughs> um, and I actually did better in math than English. But I self-selected myself out of that, and I, you know, felt I just didn't see a path. Like, what would math do for me? And in a small town, I didn't have someone to say, keep going. Like, all I saw was my amazing math teacher, Mr. Clark, and that was it. Um, so, to me, it's the role models, the mentors are so critical. Um, so, you know, fast forward, I ended up in communications. But the one thing about communications, you have to talk simply, you have to talk effectively and succinctly to tell your company story. And when I joined MasterCard, the CEO was Ajay Banga, who's now the head of the World Bank. Um, and he kept saying, we're a technology company. And I kept talking to our employees, and they were cryptologists and algorithm experts and big data, data science experts. They, were, they ran the engineers of this amazing network across the globe. And I said to myself, if that's not STEM, I don't know what is. So I proposed an idea to the CEO and said, you know, I, I think we can have a way to engage our employees as role models and mentors in their communities. And so he said to me, you know what? Do it. Um, make it better than you've done before, because I had created a STEM curriculum for another company. He said, make it global and make it for girls. And today, mm. we've reached uh, nearly 7 million, and as of tomorrow, 64 countries and territories in 10 years. Wow. Yeah, that's worth clapping for. <laughs> wow. Thanks. 7 million Seven women, million 64 <laughs> countries. That's, yeah. that's the power of impact. Um, and I want to give your mom credit, because it sounds like we need to make that M in STEM that's mom. Right. And <laughs> she was right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, 
<laughs> well, thank you for, for sharing that. I, I have no doubt that that's going to inspire a number of our, our change makers who are here in the audience, uh, as all, all of your stories will. I hate to hit sort of a somber note, but I, I'd like to sort of you know, talk about where women in STEM are today. Um, obviously, um, the pandemic caused a lot of women to leave the workforce. Um, and this disruption undoubtedly has had an impact in the STEM field as well. Um, I'd really like to bring all of you into the conversation. Maybe this time we'll start with you, Susan, and we'll go uh, down, down the panel this way. But maybe uh, could you tell us how you think um, STEM-related professions um, have been altered as a result of the pandemic and the disruption? And maybe um, not just to leave it in how it's altered, but maybe with some ideas. What do you think? Um, needs to change today um, and going forward as we live in the aftermath of the pandemic? Well, I see it you know, with girls, and even 10 years ago, it was one in 20 girls pursuing STEM subjects versus one in 20 boys. Sadly, those numbers haven't ch changed significant significantly. We are seeing more girls in those STEM subjects, but we have to keep them at, at, in the workforce, but that's a whole other topic. Um, so to me, it's sparking that interest. That's critical. But then we have to maintain that interest. So we've created you know, various curriculum, a 20-week coding program, boot camps on Python and Java, um, deeper dives into cyber and AI. These are hot mm -hmm. skill areas. We have a fabulous curriculum with discovery education on blockchain, behavioral biometrics, cybersecurity. I think we have to keep the interest all the way through, you know, through mentoring, through scholarships, and then get them into the workforce and see those beautiful role models that we have here um, so that they see what they can be and they stay. So it's, it's, we're at a turning point, I hope. I hope so too. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> Bronwyn? Yeah, it's, you know, especially for black women and women of color are, you know, an, an even smaller percentage of STEM, uh, less than 10%. Single digits. And, uh, exactly. And, uh, you know, being a little girl, for me, I got my inspiration from my father, who would say, you can be anything you want, and, you know, we would go out to the airport, this back in the day, we'd sit on the car and look at the planes, and he would <laughs> ex tell me what each one of them was. And then I started looking at ships and trains, and I was like, I like this stuff. And, um, but not every child kind of has that, um, that little bit, just that little bit of push when you're young. And uh, when I looked at what happened during the pandemic and so many women leaving the workforce because of their responsibilities around care, um, it really was a light bulb that says, we've got to put together the systems and the infrastructure for women to succeed. We cannot solve the problems on this planet with just half of the world solving it, whether that half of the world is based on uh, you know, income or the other half is based on gender. We've got to have everybody pulling together to move forward. So I, uh, I think there's a, a, an, a, I'm very optimistic about the future, um, but it is tough when you walk into the room and you're the only person that looks like you, or maybe, maybe there's one other. So working to you know, really change that, I started an organization called Black Women in STEAM, um, and it was about bringing together women across all these different disciplines of science and technology and doing things in the community to really raise the awareness and to get people involved mm -hmm. in solving problems. So uh, it, this is an exciting time to be in this space. No, thank you for that. Um, not just the important example of the work that you're doing, but sort of calling us to the intersection here on February 28th as Black History Month is ending and we're going into right. Women's History Month and really sort of bridging a gap uh, with your work. Thank you for that, Bronwyn. So, um, those who know me know that I'm a glass half full person. So when I think about what the pandemic was able to do, um, a story that I remember was it was late um, 2019. I serve on an industry board um, within the Greater Hartford School System, and I was um, working to recruit a wonderful uh, valedictorian to enter what we call our EDGE program, which is an amazing scholarship program where we put um, you know, people from underrepresented areas uh, through college, four years, books, tuition, we put them up and we also give them paid internships for four years with the hope that they will become travelers employees at the end. And I remember talking to this woman about, you know, applying for the program and she said, you know, my, my mom just passed and one of the requirements I know um, that I will have to stay at college for six weeks for orientation for your program, Tracy, and guess what? 
I take care of my siblings, so I don't think I can apply for this program because I cannot leave my siblings. And I was so devastated, and, and Tara and I had talked about it. Then the pandemic happens, and the world changed, and guess what? This needing to be at the college for six weeks was gone. It could be virtual. So this wonderful woman applied for the program, went virtually into the program, um, is now going through um, the scholarship program, actually works with a colleague of mine, Jadwin Jenkins, and she's working on N AI and Gen N AI mm -hmm. here at Travelers. And I just think to myself, if the pandemic didn't happen and there was no virtualization, maybe she wouldn't be where she is today. So I look at that as it changed the world a little bit and opened up the aperture of how we could get more people. Yeah, I agree. I agree with all of the things that you've said. I, I mostly agree with um, the comment that was made earlier that starting early is so critical. So in schools, with education, um, I also think that seeing is believing, and that's part of the reason why I mentioned you know, my team earlier. Um, when you see other women in technology uh, roles, then you believe that you can actually become like them. And so I really strongly believe that. Um, I think it's why it's so important to make sure that we have a very strong pipeline. And as you mentioned earlier, that you're not the only woman. You know, for a, a, a lot of times you may be, but then in my mind, it's your responsibility to pull other women up so that you're not the only and you're setting the tone for the future. all the, I think I'm still here. Uh, thank you for all the, the uh, examples you just gave. What, I, uh, what resonated with me was the talk about systems and infrastructure, building the pipeline, um, you know, bringing other women along, making sure that you are you know, bringing mentoring um, and opening the aperture. I, I think that there's a lot of case for optimism in all of the examples that, that all of you gave, um, and I think it's going to take all of us um, to try and uh, reverse uh, some of the, the challenges that emerged, um, but I especially love the examples that showed how technology could be a disruptor in creating new pathways for women. Um, and maybe I'd like to stay there, if, if I could, for this next round of questions, um, which I want to pose uh, to all of you. Um, we're going to start with you again, Susan. Tracy, we'll come to you to kick off a, a round. I think we've started a, a round with each of you. Um, but I do want to uh, talk a little bit more about the, the state of uh, women in the tech field today. And again, you know, really sort of looking towards the future. Um, Susan, you shared that, that boys and girls have equal interest yes. um, in science, tech, and math at a certain point in their younger school years. But then at some point, girl involvement wanes um, uh, as they enter into middle school. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what can be done to keep girls involved in these fields and develop uh, in their future careers? And I want to have all of you weigh in because it mm -hmm. sounds like um, you're looking at these issues from, from similar uh, vantage points within your, within your spheres of influence. But Susan, could you kick us off? What could be done to keep girls involved in these, steel, in these fields? Or uh, Kendra's right, um, you know, third grade, Boys and girls are testing the exact same way. Um, and then fourth grade comes and fifth grade comes and suddenly girls' interest starts to decline. Now there's a number of reasons, there's a lot of articles and research on this. It could be lack of role models, it could be that their parents aren't comfortable, it could be that their teachers aren't comfortable mm -hmm. with STEM subjects, it could be that they don't wanna be one of two girls in a class. There's, there's lots of reasons, but we know that if you do spark that interest and you maintain that interest, um, they will continue on if they see the role models. Um, I I think then it gets to the company. And you know, post-COVID, we had women leaving their STEM jobs. So we do all this work to get them there, but then ask, why are they leaving? Are they getting paid the same? Are they seeing the role models? Are they being treated equally? Um, I think we still have that conversation to have, like, why are they leaving? And have that real open, honest dialogue to figure out how you can keep these women. To me, like, I know that if I have a table full of people with different experiences, um, different voices, we're going to automatically create a better product or service for our customers. That's just mm -hmm. the truth. So we need that equal representation. It's critical. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. And I, I think for me, it is really about the curriculum. What are our kids really learning in school? 
from you know kindergarten all the way up to private school, maybe they're getting a different quality of education than some public schools, but making sure that the you know kids have the resources. So are we really advocating not only for our school districts, even if your parents are not, but also for other school districts? Because there's a huge gap uh, in terms of resources availability. And then the other part of this is are the the instructors or the teachers really well-rounded enough to teach all these new subjects, and if not, mm -hmm. how do we interject that into the classroom? Um, and then the third thing I think around girls specifically is not only do we have to empower girls and let them see the role models, but it's also empowering boys in yeah. creating this yep. kind of more gender-accepting uh, culture. And you know, maybe with you know younger children now, we can have a better influence on what you know previous generations have had when it comes to you know women in the workforce. Online, that's a whole other challenge that we've got to deal with in terms of you know bullying and and what people are, what kids are looking at these days. But I really do think we have to empower all of them to understand the value um, that it's how it is, it's important for all of them. Uh, to rise together in, in the STEM uh, workforce. Brownman, I absolutely love talking about everyone. And, you know, I feel like the role of the ally is so important. And as I look across the room, we have a few allies, you know, scattered about. But a lot of times, it's so important to have you at the table and being our supporter as well. Because a lot of times, we do feel that you know we have an idea. We do put something on the table. Does our colleague, you know, support what we're saying? Oh my gosh, Brownman, that was such a great idea. Or does our colleague actually say the same thing again? So I do want to say for those allies out there, please help all of us. And then I think we are fighting against you know a stereotype. I was talking to Susan behind um, in the green room, and if you think about the computer person on TV. It's always the person in the basement hacking the government, or maybe I'm a big NCIS fan. It was Abby with all her, <laughs> you know, stuff on. And, you know, guess what? There are, you know, women in STEM that look just like you, me, and everyone else. So we're always fighting those um, stereotypes. So we have to show up and show women and girls what we can do, whether it be, you know, coding Python and, and, and different algorithms, which is my favorite because I'm a data engineer, or it's a product owner getting ready to launch an amazing new product at a, you know, at like a P&G company. So um, I think it's important. I think so too. Um, I just wanted to key off of something earlier we were talking about education. Um, I think also upskilling is a part of that as we're in our positions and you look at AI, right? Something completely new as technology evolves. Um, and so I feel like the, the upskilling is really important from an employer perspective um, with your current workforce. Obviously, when we talk about uh, children today or, or kids, I have a teenager. Um, he seems to love technology <laughs> <laughs> because he's always on his phone. Um, so I think this, this uh, generation coming up, they do like technology for sure because they are on their devices so much, but it's a matter of making it fun and interesting, and that's really how we're going to keep them interested in staying in a STEM field. So. That's a great point. I'm also STEM. Abby, so I, I'm glad that <laughs> Abby got a shout out here at NCIS. My family would be very happy to hear that, but I love the idea of making it interesting, you know, fighting stereotypes, showing examples, making sure we're addressing and advocating, you know, gaps in resources, um, looking at, you know, studying the why and making sure that we're creating spaces that are gender accepting. I think that that's a good call to action for all of us to be yep. intentional about yes. thinking, you know, about the, the recommendations that you all gave us. Um, Want to switch it up a little bit? We're going to go into a bit of a lightning round um, uh, to just change up the pace of the conversation and maybe have you all give some quick reactions to uh, a number of questions. And I'm going to go in order. We're going to switch it up. We're going to start with you for this round, Michelle, then Tracy, oh. then Bronwyn, then Susan. Um, OK. Um, but let's start uh, just by asking um, Michelle. Let's kick it off with you. Who is your personal woman in STEM superhero? 
Ooh, good question. Um, you mentioned hidden figures earlier. So Katherine Johnson, if, for those that haven't seen the movie, it's all about her. Um, you know, she was at NASA. She was brilliant uh, uh, as a mathematician. And um, so I would say her. Um, and I have a second. Uh, at T-Mobile, we have our president um, of T-Mobile for Business. Her name's Callie Field. She's been in the field for 20 plus years. And um, I think I can speak for our entire uh, team here. We learn from her every day, and she is a true inspiration. So I would, I would name those two. I have two as well. Um, number one, Megan Smith. Um, she was the first female chief technology officer under the Barack Obama organization. I was actually at the Grace Hopper conference many years ago where she actually announced her new title and I thought she was like the coolest person ever. Um, and <laughs> along with you, second, um, our global um, chief technology and operations officer, Mojgan Lefebvre, uh, what she does every single day, the fact that she is supporting me and my role as a female at the C-suite and this table of amazing women and allies is amazing. So Megan and Mojgan, you know, great for you both to be such great role models. Also to here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bessie Coleman uh, was the first black female to earn her pilot's license and uh, she had to go to France to do that. Um, but big, big, big fan of hers. And then uh, more current day is uh, Dr. Mae Jemison uh, with my love for space. And I got to meet her. Uh, I was trying not to geek out. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was, she was talking, I was like, I have no idea what she's saying. Um, but I'm just looking at her and got to have dinner with her. Um, and it was just like, I was in seventh heaven, literally. So those two. Uh, I would say Grace Hopper. Uh, she spoke at my uh, graduation, uh, a college graduation, and I got to, to say a quick hello, and I told my mother, and she was like, Grace Hopper, Grace. Like, she knew about Grace Hopper before I did, and, you know, to this day, I just, my mom and Grace Hopper, I think they're, they're yeah. somehow guiding me. Yeah. That's nice. I, yeah. I love that we that stand on nice. the shoulders of these giants um, in the world. Thank you for those inspiring women that you named. Um, I'm going to actually come back to you, Michelle, and have you start us oh, yeah. with what area of STEM you think is ripe for more female leadership and engagement right now? Wow. Um, I would say I, I definitely touched on this earlier with AI and some of the new emerging technologies. Um, also, just maybe more specific to telecommunications is um, satellite communications. So we have a partnership with SpaceX, and we're um, really focused on uh, just learning more about satellite communications and um, all that that will bring for us. So the end of dead zones. Um, and so I think that that's kind of, that's a world we all want to live in, but it's much easier said than done. And so um, I, I personally think that it's, it would be really cool to see more and more women, um, you know, in those fields for sure, because that really is the future. So AI, satellite communications and security, I'll mention that one too, because I think cybersecurity just uh, in general is so important, not even just from a technology company, but when you think about protecting your money, protecting a lot of things with your life, um, those three areas. Yeah, for me, I would say let's keep getting our engineers out there, software engineers, data engineers, um, to the AI question. There's never been a time like now where software yeah. engineering, data engineering, data science are coming together, especially with Gen AI. So I think having more women going into these types of um, you know, roles in college and, and trying, it, trying it out is going to be great. I absolutely think we are on the precipice of a big game changer like the internet was, like the cloud was. Um, Gen AI is going to be that for us, and we yeah. women should be out in front um, leading that way and doing it responsibly. Absolutely. I agree with that. I think engineering is critical um, and very much even the foundational uh, traditional ones, mechanical and um, civil, I mean, very, very important. Um, and for me, of course, aerospace engineering. Um, but you know, in that space around tech, autonomous systems, which you know I'm, I'm, I'm in, 
which is also led a lot by artificial intelligence, but being able to see women uh, who are designing the, the future of aerial mobility as well as ground-based mobility, uh, autonomous robots. I mean, all of this is coming to bear right now. And I always say that, you know, the future is now. You know, it's all happening right now. So this is the time, and we, we know we need women in these spaces. I would say cybersecurity, AI, data science um, are critical, but that's today. I think having that curious mindset, that growth mindset, the willingness to embrace new technologies is really critical because 10 years from now, we're gonna be talking about something bigger, smarter, faster, brighter, um, yes. and our girls Excellent. and our women have to just have that mindset to embrace it and lead it. Absolutely. Actually, um, it leads right into our next question. You've, you've set us in a good place, um, Susan. But this time we're going to start it off with Tracy. Um, Tracy, if there's someone in the audience who's interested in a career move in STEM, what's a good resource or a first step for them? You know, there's so many resources. And what I would say is um, read a lot. Um, talk mm -hmm. to folks that have an interest like you do. Um, I'm very lucky. I have a um, WhatsApp group with... Um, three other men um, where we exchange a lot of the um, biggest news in, in tech and AI. So, the, you know, gone are the days of having to go to the library or look at an encyclopedia. It's all at our fingertips. So find groups of people that have the same interest as you. Right. Um, and literally, we share articles every morning. So pretty much every morning I wake up to at least four or five articles because my friends don't like to sleep, um, <laughs> although I do. Um, and I think that's just a great way. Yeah. Thank you. Bronwyn? I, I agree. I, I think also joining as many webinars about topics that you don't know is so important. I, I had an interesting convergence the other day where I was watching a, a seminar about cybersecurity with a retired general. And I was like, I love it. I'm about to go give a talk on cybersecurity uh, when I leave here and in drones. And um, I reached out to him and we found out that, you know, we grew up not too far apart totally different lives, and he is connected to some other initiatives that I'm working on, I mean, literally directly connected, and I would not have known that unless I was, you know, watching this, this webinar. Um, that's so important, and just, you know, create your own tabs in Google or, what, you know, whatever, so that you can get notifications of things that are, are of interest, even if it seems like it's heavy and hard. Um, I didn't make this transition to this work that I'm doing until, you know, after 50. So it's like there's no age that's a, a barrier anymore. We've got to actually get past ageism as well, because uh, there's a lot of talent out there that we're missing mm -hmm. out on. Now, I would yeah. say if you're focused on or thinking about reskilling, um, you know, think, think about uh, organizations, you know, there's Flatiron in New York City, there's Launch Code in St. Louis, um, there's, you know, Perscolis, there's Year Up, um, there are so many companies that are focused on uh, bringing women back to the office after time away, so a return to work, a relaunch program, um, and then the other thing, I'll give a shout out to my community colleges, because we hire from them a lot, um, those are great avenues for reskilling, and, and companies are looking for, for, for people that are coming out of them, you know, with experience from, from your first life and now applying it to your second. I think that's really critical. And Susan, I'll add to that also uh, General Assembly and Udacity, oh, yeah. where the, the fees are so low and some classes you can take without any fee at all, um, just so that you can learn and understand what's going on, because if it's not your work every day, you will be impacted by this, so good yeah. to know early. I agree. No, I, I agree with all of those. I think um, you, just educating yourself, taking the initiative to do that, um, networking, um, you know, if you see a, a position that you are very interested in, then go for it, you know. There's plenty of women in the room here that work at fantastic companies um, in the STEM space. Um, so I'll be the first to say, call me if you're interested in working at T-Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for that, Michelle, because sure. I wrote down um, that I was going to call out all of you as an amazing resource for those who are interested. So thank you yeah. for, for volunteering before you were voluntold, but I think um, <laughs> we have the benefit of, of the wisdom <laughs> of all of you on this uh, panel, and I, I think that that's a great first step yeah. as well. And yeah, great resources. absolutely. And I'll just add, Kendra, too, if, if you're not interested in sales or what I do, in, in particular, I'm more than happy to, to help you navigate to get to where you want to be. So um, I think it's important that women stick together. So the offer's there. Thank you. Tony, we're going to come to you for the next question. Um, what are you most proud of so far in your career? Um, I think that, uh, that I had the bravery to break away from the traditional corporate path that I was on and, and you know, in a great role, um, good salary. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and to then go into a completely, you know, a different field, even though I, I had a love for aviation and aerospace, but then to just step out there and decide to start new companies with a learning curve, you know, that's like this. And, um, I'm still learning every day, all day long. I've got two folks here in the audience um, that are advisors of mine and friends, and they, I learned so much from them. Um, but it's so important to, uh, for me, or at least it has been, to just take some risks, push back a little bit, because I, you know, the, I don't like what I'm doing, this you know, routine all the time. And you've got responsibilities for sure. You've got to make sure you cover those. But for me, it was taking that risk to become a founder uh, in a brand new space. I'm um, very proud of myself for that. We are too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Susan, next to you, what are you most proud of? Uh, you know, you'd think I'd say uh, creating this Girls for Tech program um, that's, that has been named the world's largest STEM program for young girls, but I will tell you, it's more about the impact and seeing girls who've been a part of the program coming back. We've hired a few as interns and full-time hires. It wasn't destined to be a pipeline program, but we're hearing the stories. That, to me, motivates me, and it's wonderful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle? Man, I would say, I mean, I'm proud of a lot of things that I've accomplished in my career. Um, if I had to pick one, um, I would say it's very similar to what was said before, too. I've, I've worked in corporate environments, um, startup environments. I've started my own business. I like to build things, um, which is similar to what we're doing now uh, in our area at T-Mobile. So I would say that just being fearless and not taking no for an answer. I'm usually the type of person if someone says, no, you can't do that, it makes me want to do it more. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty proud of that. So I'll say that. <laughs> Excellent. Tracy. When I first started in my career, um, I didn't feel like I had any um, mentors, buddies, and I think, you know, this was the late 80s, early 90s. So I feel that my role where I am today and what has led me to where I am, um, really reaching down and bringing every single person up that needs um, some confidence, just a little push, a little word of encouragement so that the new person who walks in or the new team you're on feels comfortable and knows they have a supporter behind them. Like to me, when I think about what I went through, I think it's made me who I am today to just make sure that I'm helping everyone that I can that wants to be helped to come along. Fantastic. Like that. <laughs> Two more quick lightning round questions for you, and we'll start with Susan this time. Susan, what do you want to do in your STEM-related career that you haven't yet had a chance to try? Oh, 10 million in 75 countries. Oh, that's Why it. Not? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's around the corner. It is. <laughs> Michelle? Um, I would say getting more uh, well-versed or educated on AI. Obviously, that's new, so that's new for a lot of people. Um, I've always been intrigued with space, and I mentioned that earlier. So that is an area for me that I'm very focused on. Um, I think it's fascinating. We say it's the final frontier, but who knows? Maybe it's the beginning of something that we don't even know about. We're even more excited about. So um, I would say that, yeah. 
Wow, there's so many different things to answer that question. I would say, you know, just continuing to, you know, get my influence out there within, like to me, community is what's most important. So I guess giving myself the okay to give myself more time to get out into the community. Finding that balance is, is really, really hard. Um, and I think we as women, as mothers, I'm a mom, I'm a grandmother, I'm a daughter. Um, and between all of that, trying to find the time to still make an impact and influence. So that's what I want to do. Bronwyn. <laughs> well, it's also space. I've got to get there. <laughs> I have got to get there, whether it's Blue Origin or um, Virgin Galactic. Uh, hope they're listening. Um, <laughs> I would just, uh, the fact that William Shatner went was a big, like, I love exactly. that. <laughs> big fan. Um, and um, I would love that, just to be able to say, I didn't go all the way, but I went far enough. Mm -hmm. So that would be great. Oh, yeah. I think we'll have some inner panel networking around space. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tracy, I'm going to have you kick off this last lightning round question. What's one thing, whether big or small, that you're going to do this year towards um, moving towards achieving to your answer in that last round? <sighs> Well, um, I guess uh, working with my, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, and figuring out how I can make more time to get into the community, get involved, um, hopefully get some networking done here tonight. I know I met Fran, who asked a really great question from Connecticut and how I can influence. So making the time. You know, applying. <laughs> for me, <it's> just, <laughs> um, I know they take civilians up, so it's just like applying and hopefully I'll get lucky. The key first step. <laughs> Gotta try. Exactly. Susan? Uh, well, all right. I'll tell you, my hotel room, there's a scale, which is a nice thought and then also an awful thought, too. Um, so I got on it and saw a number I haven't seen before. So what I will do <laughs> is focus a little bit on me and, and making sure that I'm healthy enough to continue to like that. Yeah. 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 You gotta put that oxygen mask on first. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's true. Michelle. I love that, yeah. Focusing on, um, yeah, focusing on myself, right? Me time, that's always important. Uh, but I'll, I'll take it back to the space piece. I think just becoming more educated on new technologies is really gonna be critical, um, but also something that I'm personally passionate about as well. So um, that's a big, area of focus this year, and um, we're well underway in, in that area. So I'm excited about what the future holds. I'm excited too, and I feel like we have a panel of futurists here. So I'm excited <laughs> yeah. about asking you all to pull out your crystal ball for this last question. Uh -oh. So we were in the green room talking about uh, the transition to Y2K, which is very much behind us, but uh, <laughs> there's another turn of the century that is coming. Um, and I, I wanna ask you to look to the year uh, 2100, which doesn't even sound right to say. Um, wow. But I could ask you, uh, and I'm gonna start with you this time, Tracy. Um, what is your hope for how our present day era of women in technology will be understood um, and studied by future generations? And if I were maybe to say that simply, mm -hmm. What impact do you hope that we're making today um, for that future generation of women? I was one of the ones who were there at midnight um, as 1999 moved into 2000, <laughs> making sure the world didn't end. So I know that that is not gonna happen when the clock strikes 2100. Um, but I think what we're seeing today, you know, here in Washington, D.C., women from all over the country, all over the world, um, making an impact, talking about how we can make things better, women's health, what we can do for education, women in STEM. Um, I think we're doing things right now that I haven't seen in the past. Um, a hundred, less than 100 years from now, we're just gonna be a bunch of women on stage. No one's gonna be talking about, do we need to get there? How do we get more women there? Because we are paving the path. We're setting it and we're gonna bring young girls and women with us and we will just be the other 50% just like everyone else. Yeah, I agree. I like that future. I love that too. Yeah. Bronwyn. Um, oh, you stole the words right out of my mouth. Um, absolutely. Uh, I think maybe in, in those conversations, we will be talking hopefully about diverse teams of people that are coming together to solve mm -hmm. very specific problems and to advance technology in an area that um, can really help humanity. 
um, I, I really think and hope that we will be well beyond um, some of the struggles that we're going through now globally on economic level, uh, geopolitics, but having women in leadership across everything, government, politics, science, engineering, um, traditional uh, fields, but making sure that, and, and also in corporate and commercial operations and enterprise, seeing that, you know, this three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent numbers are a thing of the past, and you, to your point, you're just seeing much more uh, equality, uh, both also in, in the pocketbook as well as in the uh, boardroom uh, or in the lab. Well, first I'll be texting Bronwyn in space, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I will be seeing 50-50 uh, representation in, in tech roles, uh, companies creating the best possible products and services that are revolutionary, change the world, and are inclusive for all. I love that too. Just to build on what everybody has said, I think it would be wonderful to look back um, or have folks look back and say, you know, this, because at, at that time it wouldn't be a thing, it, it would be unimaginable that we wouldn't <laughs> have parity. Um, and so just to have folks look back, kind of like we, we look back and say, man, we put a man on the moon. Maybe it's, man, we put a, a woman on the moon. <laughs> or just, <laughs> can you imagine we'll how hard it must have been for the women that paved the way to get us to where we are? Um, I would love that type of uh, environment where people are you know, praising the women of the past that paved the way um, and they're grateful for all the strides that we've made, so, yeah. I, that was really remarkable um, to hear from all of you what, what you vision the future to be. Um, and recognizing that we're uh, coming to time, I would offer my vision for 2021, which is that um, future generations will study the impact that you all are making. Uh, you know, the call out about community, building the pipeline, being a vision for the future, setting ambitious goals for how we bring more women into the STEM field, how we achieve yeah. parity. Um, I think yeah. that the strides that you all are making today are going to bring that uh, 2100 into clear focus and into reality. So I want to invite our, our audience to thank this incredible panel for sharing with us their vision for the future. <laughs> and we look forward to talking to you in space about yeah. that future that you create. <laughs> thank That's you all right. so very thank much. You. Thank you.